Hello and welcome to the Artisan Traveller podcast episode number eight and I find myself up north again in the lovely town or city rather of Bradford um, which is home to my guest today Mr Darren Speck of the Race Across the World fame from the BBC if you caught the programme uh, soon to be a second series I'm uh, informed as well. Hello Darren. Hello nice to meet you. Nice to meet you as well. Um, I suppose the obvious question is how did you start travelling? I I think it's every young person's dream to travel, isn't it? Um, I left school at a time when I, I, I was born in 1970, so at this what, early 80s, when people didn't still didn't travel a lot. It wasn't, we didn't have the easy jets and Ryanairs and all these sort of budget airlines we've got now. So I, I aspired to see, to see all these wonderful places out there. So when I were old enough and I had a bit of money, I packed my bag, caught a bus down to London, got on a bus, caught a ferry across into Europe and spent six months, six, seven, eight months, a mixture of coaches, trains, hitchhiking, all the way around Eastern Europe. And it were at a time when it was still Westerners, let's say, didn't go there so it were a mixture of excitement for meeting a westerner but apprehension for meeting a westerner because of the cold war and everything like that I, people see the anniversary of it now i remember experiencing it and living it and it was a really really exciting time going through places like latvia lithuania estonia places which had been back and visited and are very very different to how they used to be just and once you get that bug I, I, always, I always remember my parents saying oh well, go now then and get out of your system not realizing that it's not something you get out of your system no. it, every time you do it it feeds it fuels that fire and you just want to travel more and more and more it just becomes an addiction and yes it is it is a form of addiction I mean, don't worry, I'm not the sort of... I don't want to catch a flight to Costa do wherever, sit on a beach uh, and do whatever. I want... I want... See, the holidays really, I think, is not... I, want, it's, I cost it's more of an adventure, not really a holiday. Holiday, to me, defines it like sitting on a beach and all that sort of stuff. I want to explore, I want to go off the beaten track, go to museums and art gallery i want to experience something that place has to offer which possibly somewhere else doesn't and you can read all the books and you can watch all the movies but there's nothing like standing there uh, on the top of the alps and just bathing in its beauty you can't get that from any other medium but being there Absolutely, you you feel, yeah, it's something you, you can't actually, you can look at all, you know, we've, we're very fortunate now to have Google Maps and Street View and everything, you can see pretty much anywhere in the world, but that feeling you get when you travel, it's just, and you're actually in the place, that's something you can't replicate, it's just, it's what keeps us doing what we do. Yes, it, it involves, it's not just sights, it, it's an assault on all your senses. I mean, I remember cycling over the Alps and stopping at a place, I think it was in Austria, a place called Jerusalem, oh, actually. Really? Uh, and it were, it were a real tough climb, heavy bike, my gears were broken, I had three gears, cycling up this mountain. I just got out of a, a lightning storm, what scared the hell out of me. I got there, I sat there, and you, one of the highest peaks, and you looked over and you could see the Alps before you and he sat there he just bathed in its beauty if I look a, a photo you, I look back in a photo and go yeah it's okay but it's it's not the smells it's not the feeling it's not the sounds around you it's just everything about what you can only experience from being there absolutely I agree 100% with that so, Race Across the World, how on earth did that come about? Um, 
presume because I've done quite a few travels a bit of, I'm reasonably known in the cycle touring community and they must have got my name somewhere from there they contacted me asked me if I want to fill out an application form I was undecided at the first because at that time it was travel to the Middle East right there were pretty much nothing else known and I thought oh well okay then yeah so I put an application form in they rang rang me did a couple of interviews and stuff like that then about two weeks later or something oh we're going to do it in pairs because at that time it would it was supposed to be individuals oh I see but I presume they thought that the dynamic wouldn't quite be the same. Yeah. They asked who I'd like to do it with. I suggested my son Alex, but I didn't know if he'd want to do it with me. So I said, you can ask him. And I'd sort of like, and then I'd mentioned it to him, would you be interested? And then I said, oh, it's going to be a TV show. Uh, we didn't know it was for the BBC at the time. We, we knew next to nothing. And he, he decided to then do it. We had a, a couple of Skype interviews and things like that. We went down to London. We had to do some tests and all that sort of stuff. See how we interacted, see how we were like on camera, all that sort of stuff to, to, to see how we fit in, uh, how it would. But they obviously have this grand vision yeah, of how, yeah. what were going to happen. We obviously didn't know that. So they had to see if we would fit into that. Right, I uh, see. And luckily, uh, because it were a new show, that I presume there wasn't thousands and thousands, because I, I think there was something like, something like 250,000 people applied for the second series. Really? Yes. Wow. So we didn't have nowhere near that competition. <laughs> so in a way, we were quite lucky. Uh, trailblazers, if you want to, call, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Uh, so we got picked time and then we, we still didn't know anything about where we were going or anything like that we had some inoculations but the chemists where we had them they weren't allowed to tell us where they were for or which countries or anything like oh, that oh wow that's proper like mystery element, oh, so. oh yeah and it was and even then we didn't know the dates or times or anything said so, right can you get time off between this period and originally I couldn't get the time off oh I went I spoke to my host, listen, this is like an amazing opportunity. Uh, and I, in all honesty, they, they sorted it out for me. Uh, I worked for some really good people and they sorted it out. So that was quite good. And they said, right, come down to London. Went down to London, stay there the night. They then the one of the main producers came into our hotel, had to speak to us, right, you got to go to Greenwich in the morning. A car will pick you up, will take you there. Yeah, oh, well, okay then so we got there and then at that point as well we hadn't seen any of the competitors we didn't 100% know anything about what was going on it were all very cloak and dagger mm -hmm. Ooh, we got there and got given the leaflet and at that point we found out how much we were going to have and where we were going so you literally found out when you got to Greenwich what the plan was yes it was wow. probably not far off an hour or two before we set off. Wow! So you you couldn't you couldn't like obviously pre-plan before then where well, obviously no we, no we just didn't have a clue. Yeah, I suppose that's to build like the, the genuine surprise element that yeah and and to make it fair I suppose yeah and, and I wouldn't have wanted to pre-plan. Yeah, um, I, I, I'd like to think Alex and I. I mean, we made an agreement quite early on that win or lose, we were going to make sure we kept our integrity. We, although it was a race, the experience and who we were, who we are, had to be an important part of it for us. We didn't want to start sort of like slating people off or backstabbing or yeah. giving false information or any of that sort of stuff. Get it? Whoever wins, wins. But I mean, don't get me wrong, I was really, really annoyed we didn't win. <laughs> I was very, very annoyed actually. They, it took them ages to find a, an acceptable shot, uh, but it it was about the experience, and it, it were an awesome experience. I loved it. I got to 
visit some places on my bucket list. Uh, Uzbekistan was certainly one of my favourites, but China, love China. If you, if you ever want to see the future in how the UK is going to be in 20, 30 years time, go to China now. That is the future. It's When I first got there, the first thing that jumped into my head was Blade Runner. Yes. It looked yeah, like Blade Runner. It's like screens moving and everything. It's just a bombardment of your senses. Phenomenal. Classic. Beautiful place. Was there a certain part of China or was it just China in general that was just like that? Well, we only saw a tiny bit, of course, because it's a vast, vast country. Oh, yeah. Uh, and because of because of it being a restricted state, there were, yes. there were only certain parts you could film in and certain parts... It, the route we took, although we had deviations, there were only certain paths we could take. We couldn't decide to go to see Beijing or anything like that. We had to stick to certain routes. Pre we decided those routes they were predetermined by us, but once we that locked in, they set it out and go, right, you had to do this. Um, but just the cities went to Chengdu yes. China I, I think the city is something like 30 40 year old and like 15 million people there it, it's hard to imagine that in my lifetime that wasn't there yeah it's like it, it just blows my mind and yet it's another city that's so advanced with the technology that comes out of there and oh uh, it took hours and hours to get across the city. It's, I think it's known for its pandas and its spicy food. Yeah, Zashuan, isn't it? Yeah, we didn't see the pandas. It was too expensive for us to get in. We had to... No, because we're on a tight budget, of course. Of course, yeah. But we did try some of the spicy food. Luckily, it didn't show it on the show. Um, we didn't take it well. No. <laughs> I come from Bradford. It's quite famous for its curries. Yeah nothing compared I mean the the burning sensation wow I've never amazing food is it different to the Szechuan food we get in this country yes yeah um, it's like the difference between having Italian food in Italy yeah it's it's sort of similar but nothing really like it's got a a basic semblance of the essence of it but it's not really what it is. Yeah, it sort of becomes addictive, even though it's killing your mouth. And... Oh, yeah. I mean, having competitions, who who would eat? Oh, really? The, a chili. <laughs> yeah. We obviously we had a director and producer and people around and stuff like that all the time filming. I said, all right, see who could eat one, and they all eat one, and they all nearly cry. I said, right, your turn. Like, no way. Yeah. And I just didn't have one. <laughs> just set them up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And it worked. It was good fun. But then, as we got out of Chengdu. We would head toward we head towards a place called Guling. Okay. Yeah. Which were close to the checkpoint. I I've, I've never seen such beauty in my life. Was that where all like the waterfalls were and the All the, the waterfalls and no the, the limestone limestone mountains and stuff oh, like yeah. that. The rock climbing area. Yes. That's the one, yeah. Yeah, and yeah. further down. It, again it didn't show on TV. We went to a place called Longji. Right. Um uh, paddy fields, rice paddy fields. Uh and and I'm sure it's a really really beautiful stunning area just unfortunately when we went there it went up it was raining heavily and thick up cloud and we couldn't see anything at all oh, oh no. gutted I bet you were oh dear because that was the leg that you got in a day ahead of everybody else wasn't it the yeah we, we, we smashed it uh, but w where we get there we don't know when anyone else is uh -huh. unless you bump into them yeah, that and happened a few times. It, it happens, yeah. We bumped into Josh and Felix quite a bit. Yeah. Uh, and there's certain parts we'd, we'd travel together. But then when you split, you don't know if they've got a faster route or a slower route. And that's for... It, it's like Natalie and Shmima, which I don't think we saw at all on any other trip. Yeah, they seem to do more like of the sightseeing elements of the trip, didn't they? They sort of, they sort of were competitive for the first few checkpoints and then they sort of decided to make the most of it around I think the Uzbekistan bit with like the skiing and things yeah yeah that was Kazakhstan 
That's the one, yeah. Yeah, the highest ice ring in the world. Yeah. Almaty. It's a good excuse, isn't it, really? Oh, yeah. yeah. But, I mean, it worked out well for them because they couldn't have got across the border of course. in time. So, if you're going to stop, why not do something pretty amazing? Oh, definitely. But, uh, it was just that whole area, Uzbekistan, Kazakhstan, I would recommend anybody to go. And the people are really, really friendly. And, and I know... Like Tony and Elaine got a lot of stick for catching taxis, but taxis are so so cheap over there. That's it. If you've got the resource available, you, you may as well yeah, take you advantage. Could, you could travel for one hundred and fifty odd. Miles. It's like from here down to London. Let's say it'd be about sixty pounds in a taxi. Yeah, that's unbelievable. It's crazy. Yeah. I dread to think how much it would cost in the UK. That's, oh dear. I mean, granted, trains. What we got quite a few trains they were a lot cheaper but you were restricted by where that train were going of course of course yeah is there anything is there any if you were to get this opportunity opportunity again to do the race across the world is there, is there anything that you'd do differently um yeah hindsight's a wonderful thing isn't it definitely yeah. uh, I would have stopped and enjoyed it a little more not got so not be so obsessed with the actual race yeah um, I mean it were always quite strange we'd get to the checkpoints Alex loved the checkpoints <laughs> they were luxurious and it, it, well, it, they were quite special special places yeah. yeah I always I never wanted to go to the checkpoints I always have the opinion that I'm travelling around the world why do I need a break from that? What can be more amazing than that? Why would I need a rest? I mean, obviously, the film crew needed rest because although it showed us, and sometimes we didn't sleep for a long time, the film crew were there doing it all as well. And then when we did sleep, they had to back it all up and transfer everything on, all the memory cards and all that sort of stuff. So if we slept four hours, they slept an hour and a half. Wow. <laughs> so it was, it was really, really tough for them. And although it got to us, it got to them as well. It, it, the bond we got, I mean, I'm still in contact with them. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, you can't spend seven weeks with someone, 24 hours a day, and not rather total explored or have that connection. Exactly. Oh, sometimes both. Yeah, you just form a bond with that person. Because obviously you're spending all your time with that person as well, all those people rather. Yeah, and not only that, I mean, I didn't really think about it at the time, but you are you are putting how the world sees you in their hands. Yeah. Because whatever gets shown on TV, we didn't see it before it got shown on TV. When it was shown on TV, that's a, that's that's we saw it for the first time like everyone else. So we didn't have a clue how we were going to be portrayed. We knew what happened, but there's potentially a week put in a, your 10, 15 minute slot. You don't know what they're going to pick to put in that slot. So you didn't have a clue how you were going to be portrayed. So you, you were relying on them to, on their judgment, which were, on, I mean, on reflection, it was like, God, that's a really scary thing to do. I didn't sign... I signed up 100% pure and simply to travel. It being filmed were almost incidental. I, I genuinely didn't care about it. For, for me, ideally, what it would have been is travel across the world, it being filmed, and then not making TV. Because I would have got the massive experience. But, I mean, I'm glad it, it went on TV, and people still contact me. And they'll say, oh, I'm in Uzbekistan. I'm only going. Um, I, I had someone the other day, they went to Uzbekistan for the 20th wedding anniversary based on based on what I'd said about um, Samarkand wow. and what was on the show. That's incredible. So it's really how much we affected people's lives. It's like, it's... It's quite mind blowing. It shows like that though that that will in, influence people to travel. It's just you know they see a destination. I mean, I've, I've weirdly 
uh, when we went to Argentina, that was inspired by Scam City. Would you believe <laughs> someone getting mugged out in Buenos Aires? Well, yeah, we'll have some of that. Oh, yeah, it's a, it's a strange way, but yeah, and I've never really, I've never really been heavily influenced by TV, so I've never really taken that thing in. I remember we had each country we had a different person, what they call fixers, someone local would help you navigate sort of like the laws and various things like that because you were rushing through. You don't want to break a, unknowingly break a law or something, do you? Oh, it could get you in hot water. So you'd, you'd have a fixer with you that help navigate certain areas of of cultures and the way they do. And it, it changed in each country. I remember one of the fixers in Kazakhstan saying, when this is aired, you're going to change how Kazakhstan is perceived forever wow. because chances are there's never been a program like this which they hadn't that they'd never been anywhere like Kazakhstan being shown that way so we were putting Kazakhstan on the map and I'd never even considered anything until that point and that sort of blew my mind thinking that's a lot of responsibility <laughs> You're an ambassador for Kazakhstan. Yeah, it's like, well, no, I'm just racing across the world. That's all I'm doing. Weird. Has it uh, given Alex a new uh, appetite for travel now? Yes, it has. Um, he hasn't been anywhere yet, but he constantly talks about it. I did ask him, I've been away twice since the show. Abroad, I've been at various other places and things like that. I went to spend, a, I went to Morocco and then spent a couple of nights in the Sahara Desert, camel trekking. Oh, wow. Which were good fun. Camels, first hour or two, a great way to travel. After about five or six hours on a camel, it gets really, really uncomfortable. <laughs> you get you get off the camel feeling like John Wayne. Yeah. Just, you, you, your leg is so sore. But he didn't want to come. Uh, I went to the Azores, a place called San Miguel Island. And again, he, he didn't want to come. And both places have been amazing. And as soon as I got back and he's seen the photos, I went, oh, I wish I would have gone. <laughs> you know, I even offered to take you. So he's, he's still finding himself. Uh, he's, he's still unsure what to do with himself. I mean, am I wrong? I'm, I'm reaching fifty, and I still don't know what to do with myself. So at twenty-one, and that's a tough call, isn't it? It is a, a really tough call. But I suppose something like an influence, you know, he may see something like you've done with Kazakhstan, someone else has done perhaps, and then latch onto that, and then all of a sudden a whole new way of thinking emerges, and you can travel to so many different countries and parts of the world, and you know, you, you get the experiences off that. It just takes one little thing to push you forward and, you know, to travel the world. Yeah, I mean, I, don't get me wrong, Alex has done travelling. He's been to what, Australia and places like that before. He's got family in Australia. Oh, OK. But he's used to travelling, say, luxury. Yeah, doesn't mm. like the tent in the Sahara so much. No, no. no uh, he more likes the, the beach hut with the swimming pool and... All that sort of stuff on the jacuzzi. Uh, he's, he's really into all that. Where I'm not. So it, it's quite strange. We, it's really strange we've got polar opposite views on travel. Uh, I, For me, a room, a hotel, is somewhere I sleep. Yeah. And yeah. as long as it's clean and quiet when I'm sleeping, that's pretty much all I care about. Right, come on. Oh, they got a it's got a really nice shower to like what's the bar like um, it's got all this has it got has it got a jacuzzi what's the swimming pool the sauna it's like no no I just don't care about that at all <laughs> so he's he's got a way to go but hopefully he'll start to realise that he can he can do anything I, I genuinely hope he does I haven't actually spoken to him for a while um, we had a bit of a fallout so Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. No. 
Um, so you, you're, Son and parents. Yeah. <laughs> so you're keen on cycling as well. That's your other passion, uh, obviously combined with travel. You've been on some epic cycling journeys. What was your, I suppose, what was your favourite or what was the most challenging that you've done? Um, for, for total contrast, um, a couple of years ago, I cycled the most northerly point in mainland Europe to the most southerly point in Europe. So I started in, in the Arctic Circle in Norway, North Cape. It was minus 15. It was, it was brutally cold. Um, the tent broke. It got a bit further inland. Um, you'd see signs that says, the next shop is, a, is 150 kilometers. Wow. <laughs> Which is, on a bike, that's quite some time. And you, the tent broke, ended up sl sleeping in, in portable toilets, outside toilets and stuff like that. Um, just scavenging for, for water or whatever I could get. And within about a month, then I was suffering from heat exhaustion. Was that in Norway as well or was that further down? It, it was further down. I went from Norway... Originally, Norway, Finland, and then going down Sweden. Oh, okay. But yeah. it, it melted so quickly, there'd been a bit of a strange heat wave there. So it all melted, so it flooded. So I ended up coming all the way down Finland, crossing over into mainland Europe, into Estonia, going down Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Across Poland, Czech Republic, Austria. Then I was supposed to go into Italy, but I made a wrong turn and ended up in Slovenia. Oh my God. <laughs> and then cut down that way, went down Italy. I had to make a slight detour going into San Marino. And... Was that a more beautiful route though through Slovenia? Because Slovenia is quite naturally picturesque. Yeah, uh, without a shadow of a doubt. Uh, I, I love travelling around Eastern Europe. Uh, and certainly the Czech Republic people go to Prague the Czech Republic's got so much more to offer than Prague it's a, as a cyclist it's got everything it's got really good cycle infrastructure uh, it's got long stretches of flats it's got some pretty mean mountains and a lot to go over as well it's so green and beautiful and everyone's so friendly yeah uh, it's really strange certainly going out in the countryside they they love the British they love Margaret Thatcher I know she's a very divisive figure over here but they they love her over there um, because of the, the fall of communism of course. They, they partly credit that to her wow so you go you go around these villages I remember going to this village in the, in the middle of the Czech Republic and each one has got its own little town so you'll you'll cycle for half a day a day or whatever you find this little village and you'll get some accommodation or, or whatever. Say, oh, right, yeah. Um, and you'll get talking. And said, oh, um, I, I went into one place and I asked, I said, oh, ask for a meal. He said, oh, are you English? And I started talking about Margaret Thatcher and all that. I said, oh, yeah, great. Um, yeah, you get a drink. Oh, not too much. I've still got a cycle. No, no, you're my guest now. You, you, I've got a hotel. You stay there for free. You feel, you all your food. All your drink, everything is free. That's incredible. And I got that time and time again. I think partly because as a cyclist, you may be seen as somewhat vulnerable. But as a cyclist doing a long distance, people, it's a mixture of almost like want to mother you. Yeah. But also massive admiration of what you're doing. So nearly everybody's nice to you. I never got, apart from in, in Austria, apart from that, nearly everybody were nice to me. Uh, just, and I think that's what, you see so much on the media, and most of it's fear, fear, fear. Don't go here, if you do that, it's dangerous. Don't go there, it's dangerous. But travelling teaches you, that is all bullshit. Oh, definitely. And the world is, ultimately, humans are really, really nice. Yeah. And you, but if you just watch the news or read newspapers, 
it's like the world's going to hell and everybody's out to, to rob you or stab you or kill you or, or whatever. And the reality is it's not like that. Yeah, otherwise you'd never go to London. No. Yeah. It's it, the same the world over. There's always going to be good and bad in every place. So Yeah, I always find it quite funny wherever I go. It's like they always say, oh, where are you going next? Oh, I'm going into Poland. Oh, don't go into Poland. They're all really, really dodgy there. And you get to Poland, oh, I'm going to Germany. Oh, don't go into Germany. They're all really, really dodgy there. They're all, all sceptical and slate the neighbours. The whole world over, everybody always hates the neighbours. It's really funny. It's, it, yeah, it's true as well. Obviously, yeah. the English and the French and vice versa. Yeah. And, yeah. and the Scots and the English. Exactly, yeah. It, but what? it is really, really funny. <laughs> so what uh, what's your your future plans are you going to still do the cycling or do you fancy doing another long stretch across the globe what's the what's the plan um uh, i've got a lot of ideas it's i work full time i've got a, a reasonably responsible job so it's it's balancing that i'm going to say that yearning but it's more like a need it feels like a need yeah. To travel with still having a job. <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, that, like I said, the company I work for are really, really good. But I've also got a responsibility as well. I mean, I'll certainly, I'll certainly be travelling. That, that without a shadow of a doubt. I'm hoping to go to the Ukraine. Oh, yes. Ukraine. I'll be going there next year. And then, depending on whether I can get some time off... I was hoping maybe in, sometime in the near future to maybe get three or four months off work and take an extended travel around South America. Oh, that'd be amazing. I love South America. Yeah. But, I mean, in the meantime, I will definitely be on my bike travelling around the Highlands in Scotland, around the Yorkshire Dales. I'll, I'll frequently, if I have a weekend free, jump on my bike. I can cycle an hour I'm in the Yorkshire Dales, some of the most beautiful countryside in the world. And I can just pitch a tent on top of a mountain, just sit there and look out. Um, maybe a, a bit of bourbon to keep me warm on a night time. But total silence in the middle of nowhere. And I crave that I crave that that solitude sometimes and for me a bike lets me get somewhere on my own steam and I think because if I've cycled there I feel like I deserve the rest a little more because I've earned it compared to jumping on a flight which is easy and somewhat boring that's very true and what a beautiful way to end the uh, the podcast so Darren Speck thank you very much for talking to me today and uh, don't forget if you're uh, on YouTube you can subscribe to our podcast uh, likewise on iTunes and SoundCloud and thanks for listening. We'll see you on the next one.